Big issues. We've got lots of them. On this panel, we're going to deal with four. We're going to deal with the South China Sea. We're going to deal with Indonesia under President Jokowi. We're going to talk about the conflict in the southern Philippines around a town called Marawi. And we're going to talk about climate change and geopolitics in the Pacific. Four big issues. You probably thought we were tough on our speakers this morning. They had six minutes. This crew, they've got four. <laughs> All right. What we're going to do here is we're going to hustle and bustle, and we'll take our inspiration from all of those ghosts that circulate in a building like this, condemned to their broom cupboard offices, but who worked seriously hard to, to get things done, to grapple with the big issues of the day. And the big issues of the day for us are many and varied. We'd like to do our very best to boil them down, to think through the implications for Australia, and of course, to develop a conversation with all of you. Our first mini presentation is going to come from Dr. Greg Raymond. And he, he worked for many years in important and senior roles in the Australian government, particularly in the Department of Defence. Nowadays, he is a research fellow in our Strategic and Defence Studies Centre in the Bell School, where he focuses on Southeast Asian security, regional military affairs, and Australian defence policy. Greg, you've got your four minutes. Okay. South China Sea, over to you. Thanks, Nick. I just quickly want to talk about three points. Uh, the military developments in the South China Sea. I want to talk a little bit about the historical frameworks that we're using to try and look at what's happening there. And finally, I just want to finish on a couple of points about Australia's own policy on the South China Sea. Now, beginning with military capability developments, we cannot deny that there are significant developments in the past year. Uh, of the past two years, uh, China has now three islands that have been uh, converted effectively into air bases, uh, Fari Cross Reef, uh, Mischief Reef, and one other reef. Um, those are significant developments. We need to uh, factor that in. What scenarios might they be used in? Uh, they could be used, for example, in a scenario where China wishes to exert dominance against a regional country. They could also be used in a scenario where there is a Taiwan contingency and the US wishes to intervene. Uh, we shouldn't overplay their significance. Resupplying an island, any air operation, is a very intensive operation in terms of logistics resupply. Islands are particularly uh, vulnerable uh, in that sense or ineffective in that sense. Um, but nonetheless, they could take US assets out of play uh, if US assets were required to neutralise those islands. So we shouldn't either underplay or oversell the significance of these military developments. Historical frameworks. There's a tendency to look at what's happening with the South China Sea in terms of bigger frameworks such as, uh, I guess, a power transition that is occurring between the United States and China. There are analogies made with ancient Greece and the Peloponnesian Wars, the rise of, uh, of Athens uh, in relation to Sparta. Uh, we also have been looking at this, some in public discourse, that there's a decline or a deterioration in the rules-based global order. Um, I do think that we need to continually supplement uh, and look through uh, several different historical lenses at what's happening. Now, I, I will talk about uh, briefly that I do think that there's an issue with portraying the Southern China, South China Sea issue as a breakdown of the rules-based global order for two reasons. We've seen statistically uh, much less conflict, much less violence global, globally and worldwide since the end of the, end of the Cold War. Uh, but we had a lot during the Cold War. The second point to remember when we talk about is there a fraying of the rules-based global order is that most great powers indulge periodically in transgressing uh, rules and international law. We saw that with the United States in 1986 in the Nicaragua case, France in 1972 with its atomic testing in, in the Pacific. We saw that with many countries in 2003 with the uh, launch of a war in Iraq without a UN Security Council resolution. Uh, so we need to look at frameworks, other frameworks such as what's happened uh, with colonialism and neo-colonialism, how has that fed into China's view of the South China Sea, its view of its need to protect its near seas. We need to factor that into where this uh, particular problem set is going. Um, we also need to look in very 
much greater detail at the history of the claims in the South China Sea. We see very little of the work of the historians of the South China Sea, people like Bill Hayton, and looking at the claims and counterclaims and where uh, the truth might lie. We need more of that in the public discourse. I'll just finish up on Australia's policy on the South China Sea. I think roughly at the moment we've got a Goldilocks policy. It's, it's not, too, uh, not too hot, it's not too cold, it's about right. We, are, we have registered our support, for example, on the arbitral tribunal finding uh, on the nine dash line. We are continuing to conduct an operation which is called Operation Gateway, which is essentially a, a kind of uh, freedom of navigation operation. We've, we've had that operation for 30 years. We haven't stopped, but I think it's roughly sending a signal and I think we're roughly on the right track in expressing support for the rules-based global order, but not launching a, 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 a program which could be seen as trying to contain China. I'll finish there. Thanks very much, Greg. Round of applause. <laughs>It's not easy, this four minutes caper. Uh, next up is Eve Warburton, a doctoral candidate in the Department of Political and Social Change, another part of our Bell School. Uh, Eve's expertise deals with Indonesia and Southeast Asian politics. Uh, she writes often about natural resources, nationalism and also identity politics. And Eve, we'd love to hear your thoughts on Indonesia under President Jokowi. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick. Uh, so I want to talk very briefly about uh, Indonesia's democratic fragility. Uh, so for the best part of the last 10 years, there's sort of been a bit of an analytical consensus uh, about the state of Indonesian democracy. And that's pretty much been that uh, the Indonesian democracy is stable, if stagnating, uh, it's relatively liberal, uh, and it faces no serious existential threats. Uh, but that consensus uh, is now beginning to fall apart. And what we've seen is that leading experts in uh, the Bell School are starting to use words like regression, deconsolidation and fragility. And so I want to speak very briefly about uh, three sources of Indonesia's democratic fragility. Uh, so the first one is this rise of a kind of neo-authoritarian populist politics in Indonesia. Uh, it's a form of, of populism that is anti-democratic. It is explicitly, uh, it ex explicitly challenges some of Indonesia's fundamental democratic institutions. And it's accompanied by a kind of nativist xenophobic nationalism. And that politics has been expressed most clearly by Prabowo Subianto. So he's a man who ran in the presidential elections against Indonesia's president, uh, Jokowi. Uh, he lost, but he only lost narrowly. And he remains a very important player in Indonesia's political landscape. And he'll probably run again for election in 2019, Indonesia's fourth presidential election, direct presidential elections. So that's the first one. The second one is the rise or an upswing in sort of sectarian and Islamist mobilization in Indonesia. And many of you would have heard about this earlier this year, Indonesia made international headlines uh, for uh, some huge popular protests in Jakarta against Indonesia's, sorry, against Jakarta's Christian and Chinese governor. Now, these protests were led by what were once considered sort of fringe radical Islamist groups, uh, but here they were able to mobilise hundreds of thousands of people, and I should add, with the support of some of Indonesia's mainstream uh, politicians. Now, what we've learnt from that uh, mobilisation is not necessarily that we have a huge uh, increase in intolerant attitudes or support for Islamist agendas amongst the population, but we have uh, a, a, an Islamist constituency that is better mobilised, better resourced, and that has uh, the clear potential to coalesce with uh, some of Indonesia's mainstream politicians, including the likes of Prabowo, uh, and that is of a serious concern for Indonesia's democracy. Uh, the third and final source of Indonesia's democratic fragility actually comes from uh, the current government, from the Jokowi administration. Uh, now, Jokowi is um, a president who has invested most of his financial and political capital in a sort of developmentalist agenda uh, in Indonesia, in a sort of economic vision for Indonesia. He is demonstrably less committed uh, to Indonesia's democratic institutions, liberal democratic institutions, uh, and human rights and civil liberties protections. Now, we've seen this in a number of ways. We can talk more about it in the Q&A. But most recently, the way in which the Jokowi administration has responded uh, to the Islamist mobilizations that I've just uh, briefly discussed has been in and of itself um, undemocratic. So uh, what we've seen is a strong defense from Jokowi um, or a, a strong actions to defend Indonesia's pluralist and its 
um, secular foundations, but we shouldn't conflate defense of pluralism and secularism with defense of democracy. And in order to manage the Islamist threat, Jokowi has used or has bypassed, I should say, um, sort of some of the fundamental checks and balances that we expect um, from a liberal democracy such as Indonesia. So I, I guess to, to sort of um, raise once again a theme from uh, Senator Penny Wong's discussion earlier today about complacency or the concern about complacency in, Indonesia's, uh, in Australia's foreign policy, um, I think a lot of the analysis coming out of the Bell School now would warn Australia against complacency um, in regards to the stability uh, and strength of Indonesia's democracy at present. And I think I made it within four minutes, actually. <laughs> Thanks very much, Eve. Uh, splendidly done. Uh, for those of you who are paying attention to us on Twitter, we have a hashtag, hashtag ANU Australia 360. Somebody here must be tweeting away feverishly because I, I just got a text suggesting that somewhere, somehow, and perhaps it's only in this postcode, uh, hashtag ANU Australia 360 is out trending everything. Right? including hashtag marriage equality, if you will. Okay, so please, if, if we want to keep up that kind of intense tweeting, means we'll need a few more phones out in this room, please do send these nuggets of wisdom and experience out to the rest of the world. Next up, we have Professor Greg Feely, uh, who formerly served uh, the Australian government as a Southeast Asia analyst, uh, but for many years now has been based in our Department of Political and Social Change, uh, a department of which he is currently the head. Uh, Greg is one of the world's foremost analysts of Indonesian politics with a specific emphasis on what goes on in its various Islamist strains and Greg today is going to be talking to us about recent events in the southern Philippines, of course an area of great concern to anybody uh, looking at the long-term security and success of the Southeast Asian region. Greg. Thank you Nick. On the 23rd of May this year, fighting broke out in the southern Philippines city of Marawi in the island of Mindanao between hundreds of pro-ISIS jihadists and the Philippine military, Philippines military and police. Extraordinarily, the fighting is still continuing 10 weeks later, despite the deployment of thousands of soldiers, aerial bombing, extensive US military support and Australian and US intelligence support. I want to talk about this particular conflict because I think the battle for Marawi has become the most significant extreme Islamist event in Southeast Asia since the 2002 Bali bombing that killed 202 people, including 88 Australians. So why is this so significant? Because it's been the biggest and most successful display of force and jihadist intent by pro-ISIS fighters in the region. The purpose for launching this attack in Marawi was to secure territory in the name of ISIS and to stake a claim for Mindanao to become a wilaya, a pro province of ISIS. This is a much sought after status for pro-ISIS groups around the world. The sheer scale of the violence uh, is extraordinary. The death toll is approaching 1,000. Nearly 600 militants are said to have been killed. Some approaching 200 government soldiers and police are dead or missing and 1,200 wounded. And there have been 120 civilians wounded, 300,000 evacuated and much of the city destroyed. It's become the Mosul of Southeast Asia. The ability of the jihadists to resist and take a heavy toll on battle-hardened Philippine soldiers has shocked everyone. It turns out the jihadists were very skilled at urban warfare, at putting together powerful IEDs, at sniping, regularly taking out Philippines troops, uh, booby traps. This is unlike anything seen before in Southeast Asia and it was an utter humiliation and continuing humiliation for the Philippines armed forces and indeed the Philippine state. At the centre of the jihadist action is the man who's been anointed the emir or the commander of ISIS forces in Southeast Asia, Isnilon Hapilon. 
Um, and the action that his forces have taken have been lauded by ISIS, central ISIS media, and indeed ISIS has directed well over a million dollars to this conflict in the southern Philippines, as well as giving um, technical expertise. This conflict is clearly bad news for the Philippines, but even more so, it has significant ramifications for the rest of Southeast Asia and indeed the world. Jihadists across the region are being excited and galvanised into action by Marawi. We see on jihadist chat groups such as Telegram and the like rejoicing among jihadists at their, their fellow jihadists in the southern Philippines holding off the might of the infidel military of the Philippines, supported as they are by US advisers, and that these jihadists have raised the ISIS flag within the region. This is inspiring both existing and would-be jihadists not only to undertake attacks in their own countries, but also to go to the Philippines to join the fight. Um, there is already a lot of information on social media about Malaysians and Indonesians departing for the Philippines or wanting to depart for the Philippines. This is part of a, a, a many decades long trend of jihadists moving across the region, but particularly southern Philippines becoming a focal point of this. So Marawi and Mindanao have become very much the magnet for regional jihadism. Particularly as the military situation in Syria and Iraq worsens for ISIS. This becomes a much more attractive destination. The people who go there get skills, they learn things like bomb making, uh, operating in battle situations, running covert operations. The great risk is that these people return home and begin training others. The upshot will be a substantial increase in terrorist capacity across Southeast Asia over the next decade, much as occurred following the war against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan in the late 1980s and the late 19, early 1990s. So the key point here that ISIS has come to our region in a spectacular way, it's not just terrorist operations being undertaken by small cells, but rather large groups showing an ability to control territory and expose the inadequacy of regional security services. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg. Our final speaker on this panel with a four-minute mini-presentation will be George Carter, who is a doctoral candidate in the State Society and Governance in Melanesia program in the Bell School. And George's research focuses on coalitions and diplomacy in climate change negotiations. And as he's going to tell us, he has a specific focus on what is required to ensure that Pacific Islands nations are well-placed in such diplomatic affairs. We look forward to your comments. Thanks, George. Thank you, very, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I think living with climate change impacts, anticipating climate change disaster is a very real reality for many Pacific Island countries. Very much so, it's a cross-cutting priority for many governments to small village communities throughout the island region. From sea level rise impacts to low coral atolls, ocean acidification, water sanitation, salination, droughts, or heavy rainfall, to more frequent uh, extreme cyclone uh, climate disasters have and will continue to impress the region throughout the coming decades. Well, I was asked to talk on three main key points, and I think that I'll leave the last one towards the end, which is on climate partnerships. But I think the two points that I want to stress a little bit more on is on climate support or existing climate support in the region, and the third one looking at Pacific agency and Pacific leadership in international forums and uh, regional leadership initiatives. So in terms of climate support, you know, with 2005 and of course 2009 with climate finance opening up all around the world and climate finance um, being readily available, it's been a hotbed issue for many, it's a top priority for Pacific Island countries, especially in terms of special considerations, access to these funding from um, right throughout. Australia, bilaterally, Australia remains the, the top climate change adaptation provider for the Pacific as well as Germany and Japan. But what we, what we have seen lately in the last, since 2015, is India and China coming in, very interested in sort of being part of this uh, climate adaptation. Now, they do not have uh, climate adaptation programs, except other than ad hoc projects, which are primarily based on uh, di diplomatic uh, requests. 
but since 2015 to, to currently, uh, India and China have been um, starting to come in, and I've been part of one of these reports for UNDP trying to um, uh, suggest recommendations for China to be um, more heavily engaged in the region through climate adaptation. But what we do see, the, the trend in terms of climate finance in the region that we see a lot is in terms of multilateral funding. And, and this is where um, some uh, uh, disagreements uh, is starting to pop up in terms of uh, uh, multilateral organization, even regional organizations uh, fighting amongst each other to be as they are the regional implementing entities. Uh, instead of countries you know, providing direct funding through countries. So we will see a lot of um, multilateral organizations such as World Bank, UNDP, even regional organizations have a stronghold in terms of the direction of which climate finance is distributed in the region. In terms of Pacific Agency, um, my research focuses on Pacific coalitions and their participation at the UNFCC. And since 2015, there has been a group called Pacific Small Island Developing States which has been sort of the, the, uh, the main rallying point for the 14 in the Pacific, uh, Pacific Island countries in UNFCC. Of course, they're very much attached to the Alliance of Small Island States, uh, least developing group, the G77. Big acronyms, uh, there's a whole lot more. But what we do see in terms of, if we look at uh, states individually, we see the leadership in terms of a small state, let's say Tuvalu. 2015 uh, at COP, it pushed the United States all the way to the end through um, a bilateral on the issue of loss and damage. This is an example of a small state with extreme position pushing another state, uh, a bigger state. Uh, that's one example of, of which we do not see in the media a lot, but it was within the conforms of uh, negotiations. Another form that we do see, we see is when small states actually are proactive and take along big countries. So we hear the example of the High Ambition Coalition and the role of Republic of Marshall Islands. Uh, not being sort of uh, 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 the direct confront confrontational, but being the, the country that leads a group. And of course, we now see in 2017 is uh, the leadership role taken by uh, Fiji uh, in terms not only by uh, currently the president of the UN uh, General Assembly. Uh, furthermore, um, it's also the um, uh, spearheaded the um, Oceans Diplomacy Conference, but this year is the, the chair of COP23. What this sort of sees, um, what this trend sees in terms of uh, uh, Pacific Islands taking leadership is that uh, they are maturing in the age and, and having a, a more proactive uh, participation in international forum. And hopefully we'll speak more on that in further questions. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, George. <laughs> Potential war or showdowns in the South China Sea, the regression of democracy in Indonesia, ISIS in the southern Philippines, and the conundrum of climate change for Pacific Islands nations. Four big issues. We'd love your questions. If you'd like to get us started, there'll be mo microphones on both sides of the room. Uh, I'd love to see some hands go up, and I've got some in the middle over here, please, if we could get a microphone in. And if there's another hand up over here, we'll take two in a batch. Yes, thank you. Right, Glenn Robinson, businessman from around Asia. In relation to the decay of the uh, democracy in Indonesia, we've got to remember 300 years of rape and pillage under the Dutch, 30 years of stupidity under Suharto, 30 years under, sorry, the other way around, Sukarno, then Suharto. We've had 20 years of democracy. It has to be seen as fragile. Then throw somebody like Prabowo, in, Prabowo into the mix and it is a real mess. The question then is, how much uh, of the uh, Christianity Chinese is the influence in relation to Jokowi? Him being, him being unacceptable to many people. Is it because he's Christian or uh, because he's Chinese or is a Where's the balance lie? Great, thanks very much, Glenn. We'll, we'll take that question for Eve and or Greg, uh, and we'll go over to another question here. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Alia. I'm an undergrad undergraduate student at the Coral Bell School. Um, this question is also, I think, for Eve. Um, um, can we take this idea of the regression of Indonesian democracy at face value 
um, when even despite the active blasphemy trial he was engaged in, that uh, Christian Chinese um, gubernatorial candidate uh, still won the um, majority of votes in the primary election in Jakarta. And, um, you know, Islamic Party is not ever winning something more than 13% um, in, in the presidential elections. Um, does, is the Indonesian democracy is in as much danger as it seems? Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, and I'll let Greg answer some of this as well, a resident Indonesia expert. Um, so, uh, just to confirm, uh, so Jokowi is a Muslim, uh, but Ahok, which was the yeah, is the, who was the governor of who was the governor of Jakarta, uh, is both Christian and ethnic Chinese. But he was a close ally um, of Jokowi, and of course, he was only became governor of Jakarta uh, when Jokowi became president. He was the vice governor. Um, so. Uh, Jokowi has actually uh, been, and he views himself as vulnerable to the sort of sectarian mobilisation uh, that we witnessed against Ahok. And he sees himself as vulnerable, and he is vulnerable, not because he's a Christian, but because he's seen as a relatively moderate Muslim and as a defender of Indonesia's, um, as I said, secular and, and pluralist base. And so for conservative uh, and, and obviously the right, uh, right wing and, and radical Islamist groups, but also more generally for sort of the more conservative um, types of, of um, Indonesian Muslims, they are to an extent ambivalent about Jokowi's religious credentials. Um, and he's always been quite concerned about that. Um, so, and I think I can sort of answer both questions at once here. Um, and that is what we saw in Jakarta, um, and I should add, that, which I didn't mention in my, in my talk, was that that mobilization was very successful. So Ahok was a very popular incumbent, um, uh, but he lost the election decisively in the second round um, uh, to, um, to a pair, uh, to Anis Baswedan, um, who very much benefited from, and allegedly people who supported Anis Baswedan mobilized uh, the, sectarian, uh, the sectarian protests as well. Um, he lost it decisively, despite being a very popular incumbent, and he's now in prison for, for two years on blasphemy charges. So you have a popular incumbent in one of the world's largest cities and one of the world's largest democracies sitting in prison for two years. Um, now, it was a very specific case, of course, but what it demonstrated was that even a small right-wing constituency, one that we thought was just a fringe radical group, can be mobilised by the mainstream uh, pop politicians in Indonesia by mainstream political parties to their own political ends. And while we might think that case was so specific, Indonesian politicians, Jokowi, they are nervous and they can see that there might be other circumstances in which that constituency can be mobilised once again. And they're all very concerned about a coalescence of that constituency with a kind of neo-authoritarian populist figure like Prabowo come 2019. If you want to add something, Thanks, Greg. Steve. Quickly from Greg. Yeah, yeah. very quickly. Just... One of the big analytical challenges with um, looking at what happened in the Jakarta gubernatorial election earlier this year is precisely this issue that Eve referred to about it being one-off. And specifically, we had a very outspoken Chinese Christian who was accused of blasphemy. And blasphemy is always um, one of the most emotional issues in Islam. And anywhere in the Muslim world where someone is accused of blasphemy, there is always a very powerful outpouring of, of emotion against them. And so, uh, yes, we, we had this mobilisation of Islam in an unprecedented way in Jakarta. The question is, will those same conditions exist in any other regional election or indeed the presidential election in 2019? I'm one of those who believes it's very difficult to do but there are political spinmeisters from the US who say we can manufacture these kinds of issues even if there's no basis in fact. So um, that will be the interesting thing for us all to sit back and observe over the next few years as to what the continuing mobilising power of Islam is. And it may not be as big as, the, as those with the most negative interpretations say. Thanks very much, Greg. Two more questions. I can see a hand up right in the back row here. Let's start with you. And then I'll take three. We'll come down here and then over into the middle. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning. Michael from Crawford School at ANU. Uh, my first question was in relation to uh, Jokowi's nervousness um, about his Islamic credentials and so forth. Uh, in an Indonesian article by Tempo uh, the other day, it said that he was considering Gatot... Uh, um, military hard man as his, as his running mate, his vice president for 
the 2019 elections. Given uh, he sus or Gatot and suspended military cooperation earlier this year with Australia, how do you think he, as a vice president, might Im impact or, or possibly damage um, Australia's relations with Indonesia in terms of that? Uh, my second question was in relation to the um, inquiries by the uh, Legislative Assembly into the Kapeka, the anti-corruption authorities. Do you think that is possibly a regression in Indonesia's democracy, consider considering the House of Indonesia's democracy is now bringing serious questions against um, the anti-corruption authorities in relation to their powers uh, for investigating um, serious and systemic corruption? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a question down here, please. Next month. Sorry about this, another question on Indonesia. Miles, Co Miles Cooper. Um, in the discussion so far, there's been almost no mention of the Indonesian military. Um, have they dealt themselves out of politics in Indonesia? Or um, within the military, are there different groups which could nevertheless play a significant role? Thank you. And then one more back here in the middle. Thank you. Uh, my question is about the role of Saudi Arabia in what is happening in Indonesia and possibly in uh, the Philippines as well. Uh, you would be familiar with the uh, recent visit of the Saudi royal family, the investments, and even to the extent of um, the Islamic architecture of the mosques changing to meet the Saudi uh, Wahhabi requirement rather than the traditional Indonesian architecture. Thank you. We'll need you to be brief in your responses to these good questions. Yes, thanks Eve, over to you. Um, I'll respond to the question about the Corruption Eradication Commission. So um, without getting into the micro details, this is just the latest um, of many, many attempts by the Indonesian parliament to try and sort of um, dis disempower the, the, the Corruption Eradication Commission. And uh, for non-Indonesia watchers, this has been sort of one of the um, I guess the flagship, I guess, reform, democratic reforms um, in Indonesia, and it's a very, very popular institution, um, and the parliament is incredibly unpopular. Um, and yet, they continue to try and, um, and to attack the, the, the capacity of the KPK um, to investigate politicians. Um, and now the question is whether the KPK will continue to withstand these attacks. It has until now. It's becoming a little less popular publicly. It's becoming a little more prone to... Um, accusations of bias and corruption in itself. Um, so the question is whether it will last the, you know, from now until the next sort of five to 10 years. And that will depend hugely, I think, um, on support from the president and, and it will depend hugely on who the next president is after 2019. Very briefly, Angata Numantio is, is vice president. Um, it really uh, <laughs> uh, is a horrifying um, possibility. <laughs> Uh, I don't think the possibility of that happening is very great at all. In fact, I'd put it as minute um, because um, Jokowi has a very bad personal relationship with Gatot after the, all of the, um, the demonstrations and indeed the riot in Jakarta late last year because Gatot was seen as one of the people who was fomenting that unrest. Now, how much of that is true? Uh, but he certainly contributed in public to some of the anti-Chinese um, animus and, um, and he played, I think, a, a highly reprehensible role for someone who was the commander of the armed forces. One could imagine if Air Marshal Vin Binscombe said something like that in Australia to worsen social unrest. So he sees himself as a political player. Um, he has a very insidious effect upon the public discussion in Indonesia. And I think he's unfit to be vice president. It doesn't mean to say he would be, but I think it's extraordinarily unlikely that someone like Jokowi would take him as a running mate. He has, for example, the chief of police, Tito Canavian, who would be um, a much more congenial running mate for him. Um, uh, Miles' question about... And for Australia, um, Gatot, it was a humiliation for Australia to have to go and apologise to Gatot over what happened in the SAS base that caused the severing of relations earlier this year. I don't think the Australians shouldn't send and Angus Campbell to go and apologise, perhaps send ahead of the SAS. I think it sent all the wrong messages about Australia's excessive deference towards the, the Indonesian military sentiment in Indonesia. I think that was a mistake. 
growing a significant military role in Indonesian politics? I don't think so. It really would be um, only if you got large-scale unrest on the streets and military would suddenly have a... Um, uh, an opportunity to to engage. Otherwise, it's going to be individuals rather than institution. The final question about the role of the Saudis. Certainly, the Saudis, as they are in much of the Muslim world, are investing many millions of dollars, are sending many hundreds of preachers, Salafist preachers, to places like Indonesia and the Philippines. And, of course, King Salman visited Indonesia, Malaysia earlier this year. And it was part of a big diplomatic initiative that, you know, I can't really talk much about, but... Jokowi complained about three weeks ago that he wanted 20 billion from King Salman when he came to Indonesia. He got a promise of 1 billion and he complained several weeks ago the Saudis haven't paid a cent or perhaps a real um, to Indonesia as yet. And there's great scepticism that the Saudis are going to be even good for that $1 billion. And so there is great scepticism about Saudi promises in the region. Um, I think it's easy to overstate the broader religio-cultural significance of Saudi intervention in, in Islamic affairs in countries like Indonesia. Certainly there's a tiny number, tiny percentage of the community who are drawn to that kind of puritanical teachings, but in the mainstream, not significant impact would be my response. We are almost out of time, unfortunately, with this quick roundup of the big issues. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give each of our panellists an opportunity to have a final 30 second sprint. In that time, I'd really like them to try and take us out of this lukewarm stupor that we got into this morning. Everything was lukewarm, you recall. I get the sense that some of this is not lukewarm, so I'd like an impression of the temperature, what are we dealing with, and where is the temperature likely to go in the future, if you don't mind. Greg, we'll start with you on the South China Sea. Yeah, just to come back to the history and the relevant history, I, I didn't say too much about that. I think it's important um, that Xi Jinping recently gave a speech where he talked, uh, and he's setting out his credentials now for what is the closest thing to an election, which is a people's assembly, which will happen towards the end of this year. But he said, you know, in in his term for the past five years, uh, he has made China a strong power. And I think you know, what he's done in the South China Sea is very much part of that. And that certainly feeds into uh, where China believes it, it has come from, where it needs to be. Uh, can I, just one little uh, historical anecdote, which is quite interesting, I found out recently. In World War I, China made quite a significant contribution to, um, to the Allies. They, they wanted to integrate with the world, and they sent 200,000 labourers to France. About 2,000 of those died in France. They expected to get some repayment at the Paris Peace Conference. In fact, they didn't even get control of the German whole protectorate in China. That was a big slap in the face then. So China wants to feel strong again. Uh, having control of the South China Sea, to some extent, is part of that historic trajectory. And that's one part of the history we need to keep in mind. What's the temperature, Greg? <laughs> Eve, the temperature, please. Um, obviously, I'm rather pessimistic about Indonesia's um, democratic fragility at the moment, but I don't want to leave um, our audience with the impression that the Islamist mobilisations or that radical Islam or something of the like is, is the most um, proximate uh, source of Indonesia's democratic fragility. In fact, it's not. Um, what we're much more concerned about is the constant sort of debate um, around fundamental democratic institutions in Indonesia that are coming from mainstream uh, political elites, mainstream political parties, including from the president's party himself. Uh, and we're very concerned about the sort of degradation, the protection of, of civil liberties in Indonesia. Um, and, and for that reason, I am, uh, what's, what's lukewarm but on the cold side? Cool? cool. I'm feeling cool. <laughs> <laughs> tepid. I'm feeling tepid. That's much better about Indonesian democracy. Okay, thanks very much, Eve. Greg? Uh, in a flush of optimism, I'm going to try and say that warm, there's warm things regarding Marawi. Uh, ironically, terrorism has given Australia diplomatic opportunities in the region that um, have been actually very beneficial for its regional diplomacy. I mean, it's doing a lot of co helping with coordination between Malaysians, Indonesians, Philippines and the like. Um, and also a very good thing Australia is doing is it has a large aid program in Mindanao in the southern Philippines. It's putting a lot of money into, for example, improved education and welfare services there. Uh, there is a great opportunity in Mosul, in, sorry, Mosul, in um, Marawi, um, to not make it like another Mosul for the rebuilding of Marawi, which the Philippines government has given 
the contracts to well-connected Christians, not to Muslims, those kinds of things could create problems for the future in jihadist recruitment. Australia could play a role in that, so it continues to offer us more diplomatic opportunities if we want to take them. So, warm. Thank you, Greg. George. Um, climate change. <coughs> Uh, Pacific countries have used this uh, in, a, in a way climate change has been a lifeline to a lot of Pacific countries to not only reinvent so they're using climate change in a way for more finance to um, f to build up its economies as it transitions its economies to low carbon uh, economies uh, and, so, and it's also a way to reinvent diplomatically uh, to show their um, uh, a bit more finesse within um, uh, international forums so that's what I'd say and um, so it's a, an opportunity it's a lifeline for Pacific Island countries uh, to reinvent uh, uh, diplomatically, but also use it as a, a way of gaining financially to build economies. And the weather in the Pacific is always tropical. 